I'm Alexander Mesenko, I'm a member of the executive board of Razan Ifal, and today I would like to tell you something about ethics and digitalization in the context of the Belarusian crisis since 2020. First of all, some more words about our organization. Razan Ifal is the first and largest association of Belarusians and friends of Belarus and Germany. It was estimated um, on August the 9th of 2020, the day of the so-called presidential election, and it has now around 270 members all across the country. And as already said, uh, our main tasks are to protect the interests of the Belarusian diaspora in Germany, to promote Belarusian culture and language, to lobby for a democratic Belarus, and to offer help for Belarusians' needs, especially uh, victims of um, repressions of the Alexander, uh, of re regime of Alexander Lukashenko. So today's presentation consists of four parts. We're going to talk about the election observation process, about the role of Telegram and VPN during the protests, um, about electronic methods by the regime to suppress the protests, and as well as about method of de-anonymization, which is used by the regime as well as by the opposition. Uh, so in the pretext of um, presidential election of August 2020, the initiative Golos, which means voice, called voters to take photos of their voting ballots and to send them to them. And as a result of them, they received data from 1,310 polling stations, which we could compare with the final election results. Um, they confirmed falsifications at every third polling stations and published their results on the website Belarus2020.org, which is by the way, also available in English. Um, and another partner initiative of GOLOS is the Zubur, which is also a platform for observers and voters, and which also deals with the documentation of voting violations, um, especially the published data of members uh, of the electoral commissions. And as a result of that, they documented 6,798 incidents of violations during the voting process. Regardless of this, uh, the Central Election Commission declared that Alexander Lukashenko had won the election with around 80% of the votes. And of course, they knew that uh, this kind of fraud wouldn't be accepted by the people of Belarus and took some specific measures. In the first three days after the falsified presidential election, internet, the internet in Belarus was completely unavailable. Uh, only people who timely managed to uh, install VPN uh, programs on their mobile and uh, computer devices were able to access the internet in these days. And in addition to that, several websites uh, critical towards the uh, government were blocked by the regime. Um, the protesters mainly coordinated their demonstrations through Telegram channels or Telegram chat groups. One of the most famous one is the Telegram channel Nexta. You might remember that in the May of this year, uh, the main director, as the then main director uh, of Next, uh, Roman Protasevich, was arrested after a false, uh, yeah, after a, a plane was forced to land in Minsk because of a false bomb threat. And this uh, Telegram channel had around 2 million subscribers for, uh, so in, the, in the August of 2020. So it was an important resource for people who took part in the protests. In addition to that, uh, people also turned on uh, Wi-Fi access for protesters. And this is only one example for the civic network of solidarity, which was emerging at the time. In fact, dozens of neighborhood initiatives and volunteer groups emerged in August and in the following months. They exchanged mainly via Telegram channels and there was also a worldwide connection with diaspora. A prominent example for this kind of cooperation is uh, the website Zia Chat, which means as much as where is a chat, and it's a website which offers the possibility, yeah, which offers an overview of regional protest and diaspora telegram chat groups. And of course, this website is also blocked in Belarus um, and is only available via VPN for people from Belarus. So following the brutal crackdown of the protest, the regime declared most Telegram channels to be extremists. Hundreds of people were and are still being sentenced for simply reposting content from Telegram channels 
On this image, for example, you can see the Telegram channel zerkalo.eo, uh, formerly known as Tutbai, which was one of the most famous news outlets in Belarus. And it was also declared to be extremist after publishing critical information about the government. So closed channels and websites are only available through VPN for the people of Belarus. But uh, blocking websites is not the only electronic method used by the regime to suppress the protests. They also cut off or slow down mobile internet during the protests. They use total video surveillance and uh, face recognition. So the number of CCTV cameras in Belarus has drastically increased after the beginning of a the protest. They uncover IP addresses of people who write critical comments about the government to persecute them. And they use geolocation data and client data from mobile providers to seek out protesters. Um, and also to sentence them. And this was also a reason why many people who attended protests, who attended demonstrations, uh, left their mobile phones at home for security reasons. So the company Telecom Austria, for example, with its sister company A1 Belarus, was heavily involved in this kind of um, censorship. So they consciously slowed down mobile internet during the protests on the order of state authorities, which they also openly acknowledged. Um, another important company is LLS, LLC Synesis, uh, a Belarusian company which uh, produced a video surveillance system called Keypot, which is used to track and identify dissidents in Belarus. Um, on this image, you can see Nikolai Zedok, a prominent Belarusian writer and activist who was arrested last year after being identified by the Keypot's technology. And on the image, you can also see that he has become a victim of torture. Um, pepper spray was uh, used and um, they beaten him up. And he later also reported uh, of being strangled by the Belarusian authorities. So LLC Synesis is now under sanctions, but European advocates of the law firm uh, will defend Synesis in court. And new companies are also created to circumvent the sanctions and to continue the work. For example, Navigsoft. Um, the mobile provider Bell Telecom is also a significant company. Uh, according to recent reports, KGB infiltrates Bell Telecom to obtain clients' data. KGB is a secret service of Belarus, it's still called like that there. And based on geolocation data, the protesters are singled out and entered into blacklists. And after that, employers are being forced to fire people from these blacklists. And often, um, yeah, the people on these lists are also have to face criminal trials or other forms of persecution. Um, another electronic method used by the regime as well as by the opposition is the de-anonymization of people. The Lukashenko regime regularly publishes personal data of uh, activists or people who attend protests on state TV, pro-government telegram channels and courts and so on. And they also publish humiliating confession videos of these people. And the opposition in response uh, leaks audio recordings of government officials, policemen, businessmen, and other representatives of the state. Um, the cyber partisans mainly use this kind of strategy. It's an anonymous pro-democratic activist group, which hacks and publishes online personal data of regime insiders, security officers, and denunciators of people who call the police to inform them about the protests and so on. And they also published a website with the title Black Mac of Occupiers, which contains a map with the addresses of um, judges, policemen, denunciators, and other people who are somehow related to the ongoing repressions of Belarus. Um, yeah, considering all these facts, it might be interesting um, to have a look at the ethical aspects surrounding this topic. So I think without a doubt, we can say that the Lukashenko regime continuously disrespects the human dignity and human rights of its opponents. A uh, very prominent example is uh, the case of Roman Protasiewicz, the main director of the Telegram channel next uh, after his arrest, was directly one week after his arrest, arrest, he was not even able to see his lawyer in this time. Um, a TV interview, if you can call it like that, was aired. And yeah, he was saying there that uh, 
yeah, he, he started to praise Lukashenko and started to confess about uh, what he has done wrong. And it was obviously seen that he was under psychological pressure. And in the end of this uh, TV talk, uh, he also started to cry. Um, there is a massive problem in Belarus of uh, denunciation. So considering this black mag of occupiers, one can see that there are a lot of pro Lukashenko people who seem to have tackled personal issues uh, and therefore denounce their fellow citizens. It seems to be a long Soviet tradition. And a very interesting question surrounding this uh, topic is whether the cyber partisan strategy, strategy is ethically justifiable. So by answering this question, it is important to keep in mind that there's no rule of, Belar no rule of law in Belarus and that we have to deal with a big uh, case of legal default. So there are uh, the courts and justice, they carry out political instructions, there are arbitrary arrests and absurd trials, and citizens are deprived of any other possibility to claim their rights in court. So publishing data and social shaming can be seen as ways of uh, peaceful civil resist resistance. And in addition, the citizens have to trust these cyber partisans because um, yeah, they also hack the database with passport data of all Belarusian citizens. And yeah, therefore, some kind of trust is needed that uh, the cyber partisans use these data in for good moral issues and uh, do not uh, use these data for other um, for other purposes. So trust is in this case, the basic principle and the most valuable currency in these times. And at the same time, distrust is massively growing in the Belarusian society today. So to sum up, I would like to end this presentation with a quote of the historian Alexander Friedman, who dealt with, uh, with the topic of people whose data was published without a trial or investigation by the cyber partisans, he wrote, this is certainly unacceptable as a means of political struggle in a democratic society, but Belarus does not have a democratic society. Belarus does not have democratic institutions, there are no independent courts, and the police are a tool of, for the Lukashenko regime to solve its political goals. In Belarus, the state and those who oppose the regime are fighting without rules. Therefore, no one thinks about ethical issues. In this sense, there has been a terrible skew over the last year. And this is an injury that will affect the further development of Belarus. We see the same pro-government telegram channels that publish insulting, horrific confessional videos. It has nothing to do with ethics at all. And on the other hand, the cyber partisans obviously assume that there is no place for ethical behavior. Why should we use ethical principles as the struggle is waged against us? So we respond. When this struggle is over, many questions will remain. What are the ethical criteria in general? So to sum up, I would like to thank you for giving us the possibility to, to like talk more about uh, what's going on in Belarus. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And we would really uh, looking for forward if you have any questions considering this topic, you can always contact us. Yeah, thank you very much.